Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. I'm Sharon Marshavi. I'm Senior Vice President at ICFJ, the International Center for Journalists. And this webinar is part of our Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. Our goal with this initiative is to help journalists in our network around the world to cover this incredibly massive, fast-moving pandemic. Many of you here today are members of the forum's closed discussion group. More than 1,800 journalists from around the world have joined so far, which is fantastic. If you'd like to join, uh, we're going to put the link to the group. Uh, it should pop up in the Zoom chat in a second, so please do join the group. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, that means you have already joined. It really is an amazing space. In just a week, we have seen so many connections and collaborations being born. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, I know everybody is very busy, so we're going to get started. I am very pleased to have with us today Dr. Angela Rasmussen, PhD of Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health in New York City, although she's sitting in Seattle today. Uh, she is a virologist who studies host responses to infection, and she's investigated multiple viruses that pose a public health threat from Ebola to MERS, from dengue fever to the flu. And she's here today to help us understand how the virus spreads, as well as the disinformation that unfortunately is spreading along with it. So I put together my questions based on a lot of the ones that you all have submitted earlier, and I'll try to incorporate ones that you put up in the Zoom chat and that come in through Facebook Live as well. So just a reminder to everybody, this conversation is on the record, and so you're free to use quotes, audio, video clips, and we'll post the full video to our website in a couple of hours. So Dr. Rasmussen, thanks again so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time. So my first question to you is, where did this virus come from? There's so much speculation, so much rumor about where it originated. That's a really important question um, and one that I've been fielding a lot. So we think based on genomic data that this virus originated in bats. The, the most closely related virus that we've to date found um, is a, what we call a SARS-like coronavirus um, isolated from a bat in a cave in Yunnan, China, which is um, actually quite distant from Hubei province where Wuhan is and where the, the pandemic really originated. Um, so it's not the exact same virus that was found in that bat in 2017, but it's a very, very close relative um, to both this virus, SARS coronavirus 2, as well as uh, what we're calling SARS classic. Why is it transmitting so far so fast? And, and how infectious is it compared to other viruses that you've studied? So that's a, that's a really important question and one that has not been completely answered in terms of why it's so much more infectious. There are certain molecular features of the spike protein, which is the protein on the surface of the virus particle that binds the receptor and allows it to get into cells um, that some have speculated may be uh, responsible for it being more efficient at infecting cells. Um, that's called a, a furin cleavage site. Um, it's also possible that um, our behavior uh, with this virus has allowed it to sort of expand beyond where it originally emerged, unlike SARS classic, which was contained um, in China and Hong Kong. This virus has uh, managed to expand outside of those borders and is now spreading freely in other countries. One thing we don't know is if SARS classic had been able to do that if it hadn't been recognized when it was, if it could have been more easily contained. But this virus does appear to be somewhat more transmissible than, than SARS classic, and it's certainly more transmissible than MERS coronavirus. Okay. And I think the other thing is, how did it actually get into the population where people are asking, did it, I mean, we know how it transmitted, but were people eating bats? Were they, was it, you know, physical contact? Can you explain a little, a little bit about that? So we, we don't know. Um, and it's possible, so for both SARS classic and for MERS coronavirus, there is another intermediate species that's involved in the transmission to humans. Um, MERS primarily, MERS outbreaks are started by um, zoonotic transmission or transmission from animals from a dromedary camel. In SARS classic, it was an animal called the civet that was present uh, in some markets. In this case, um, one market has been identified as a possibility for its origin. However, there were cases prior to the, the initial cluster of cases that was first reported 
um, that have been identified since then. And those, some of those people have no affiliation with the market in any way. So it's completely unclear how the encounter <clears throat> between the species that first transmitted this to humans um, and those humans occurred. But what we do know is that this has only been a single um, or relatively isolated cluster of zoonotic transmissions, and the vast majority of the transmission has been person to person. So it's, it's less important right now whether that um, originated from a so-called wet market or from just people being in the wild coexisting with wildlife that might be carrying the virus. Um, that's a very open question and one that is important to understand for right now though, um, that is not the first priority in terms of uh, many people's um, research. One of the things people do feel as a priority to understand right now, I think, is can they be reinfected? If you've gotten COVID-19, do you have immunity afterwards or, or no? Those are the really critical questions. Um, when does transmission occur from people? Um, does it occur from asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic individuals, which it looks like it does? Um, and can you be reinfected? Will you have lasting protective immunity? The, the short answer is that we don't no. Um, however, there's a lot of evidence that is accumulating that suggests that we, most people anyways, do develop protective immunity. So they've looked at patients who've recovered. Um, they have antibodies in their blood that are specific to the virus, suggesting that they would be immune to it at least for uh, as long as those antibodies last. How long they last is an open question that people will continue to look at. In addition, there was a study of experimentally infected rhesus macaques, so non-human primates, um, that, uh, that were challenged with virus, um, allowed to get sick and recover, and then challenged a second time with virus, and they were not able to be reinfected, which suggests that indeed your primary infection does induce protective immunity and reinfection is unlikely. Okay, I think that's probably news that people would, would prefer to hear right now. Indeed. <laughs> uh, another question about immunity is there, there's lots of talk of herd immunity in terms of how many, what percentage of the population needs to get it in order to protect everybody. What are the estimates about that right now? And does that mean then that most of the population has or will get COVID-19? That's a very open question. So when epidemiologists, which I am not, by the way, I'm a virologist, but when epidemiologists talk about this, they talk about a number called the attack rate. And that's the number of the population that um, will get sick from getting this virus. What we don't know is what that is eventually going to be. Um, some of that will largely depend on the, the physical and social distancing measures that we're taking now. Um, some of it will depend on the development of a vaccine. I hope that we are not at the point that we are developing herd immunity by having everybody get infected. Um, because even though the case fatality rate, <clears throat> pardon me, is, um, is fairly low uh, comparative to, to MERS and SARS classic, um, when everybody is infected with that, even a low case fatality rate means millions of deaths. Um, so I'm hoping that we would induce herd immunity in the population the way that we normally prefer to, which is through mass vaccination. What's the likelihood that this is endemic, that it's recurring, that it's seasonal, like, again, like the flu? That's a very open question and one that I don't think we can answer right now. Um, that does in part depend both on the creation of a vaccine as well as how long the protective immunity for such a vaccine would last. Um, unfortunately, the, the length of time that you develop protective immunity, uh, whether from an infection or a vaccine, um, is something that you can only learn by monitoring people over time. So it's not something we're going to have an answer to anytime soon. Personally, it would not surprise me if this did become endemic, particularly if there ends up being a seasonal component to it. Okay. And speaking of seasonal, one question that we've gotten from a lot of folks is, is this, does this get, you know, we've had, there have been very few incidents or relatively few in, in the warmer parts of Asia. And that has prompted a lot of, again, talk and speculation that hot weather, humidity kills the virus. How, how likely is that? I don't know that that's entirely true. Um, certainly, so if you're talking about Singapore, um, the reason why 
the virus. Cambo is Cambodia, Philippines to relatively lower rates, less, that's, less the better, that's but not correct. as good healthcare systems as well. Right. So I, I don't know that we can completely chalk that up though to the environment. Um, certainly the virus does spread in those places and people can develop severe disease. Um, there have been deaths, I believe in the Philippines and in Singapore. Um, we, we don't really know um, how the environmental conditions affect this. Certainly in the environment, high temperature and humidity um, does appear to reduce the amount of time that coronaviruses can remain infectious. But it's key to emphasize that with all viruses, viruses require a host in order to replicate. So viruses do not typically persist. Um, enveloped viruses like coronaviruses don't persist in the environment. That is not the number one thing that is going to be driving transmission. Most transmission is driven by person-to-person -person interaction, so um, exposure to respiratory droplets, as well as potentially exposure to um, contaminated surfaces or fomites. Uh, but again, viruses need a host to reproduce, so the majority of transmission is going to involve a person, and that is independent. People are uh, a pretty effective virus incubator, regardless of what type of climate they live in. Can you talk a little bit more about surfaces, how the virus spreads through surfaces, if you've touched a cardboard box, money, and also the rate of infection that, and the danger it poses uh, if there is some virus still on a surface like that? So the risk is not zero, but it's really difficult for us to quantify the risk of transmission from surfaces because a lot of factors um, and variables go into that. So uh, if you, part of, the, part of the issue would be how much virus is on a given surface. Some of it is how long can the virus remain infectious on that surface and how long is your contact with that surface? And at what point after that contact are you touching your face, touching your nose, touching your mouth or your eyes? Um, one thing that we don't know is what the minimum infectious dose of virus is. So probably it's not, uh, it's not extremely low. Um, probably it's more than a single virus particle that you need to establish an infection because your respiratory tract has protections in place. So um, there's mucus, there are cilia, um, there are barriers, natural barriers that um, protect us from infection. So it's thought that for most of these types of respiratory viruses, you need a sufficient dose of virus to sort of make it so that there's enough lucky viruses that get past those barriers to actually cause a productive infection. We don't know what that number is for this virus, and that would greatly impact um, the risk of transmission from fomites or surfaces. Okay. And uh, we've got a question here about people are asking, is it se sexually transmitted? I mean, I think it's, why don't you just explain that a little bit, I think would be useful for some folks. We have no evidence that it's sexually transmitted. Um, we have no evidence uh, that it's also transmitted by feces, even though um, they've discovered feces uh, with, uh, or stool with um, infectious virus in it in some patients. So right now, I mean, there are a lot of open questions. It's not to say that that's completely out of the question, but it's unlikely. We don't, um, respiratory viruses like this in general are not sexually transmitted. Uh, so it, it would be unlikely, but um, it's not completely ruled out. Great, thanks. Let's talk about masks a little bit. There's been a lot of discussion right now. Uh, the WHO and the CDC here in the US have been recommending it only for those who are sick and obviously for healthcare workers. The reports that recommendation, at least from the CDC, might be changing. What is your view? Do you think if there were an endless supply of masks, everyone should be wearing them? Should we be making our own? What, what are your thoughts about masks? So I have mixed thoughts on masks. Um, certainly, Generally, it's okay to wear a mask if we had limitless supplies. Right now, um, health, frontline healthcare workers are facing critical shortages of PPE, including surgical masks, which um, for, for healthcare workers who are doing what we call aerosol generating procedures, that increases the risk that there might be small particles in the air, which are potentially um, stay around in the environment for longer and are potentially more infectious those healthcare workers need to be wearing N95 particulate respirators um, or masks that will protect them. 
Uh, surgical masks generally don't protect the wearer so much as they protect other people. So the, the, purpose, the main purpose of a surgical mask is to reduce the number of respiratory droplets that the mask wearer is producing. So in that sense, wearing masks um, is primarily a benefit for others rather than the person wearing the mask. Now that said, um, that studies have shown that, that mask wearing can reduce the transmission of other respiratory viruses, including influenza. Um, the problem is, is that when masks are not worn correctly, when they're reused, when they're touched on the outside, um, they can uh, create alternative risks for infection. So um, people wearing masks where they're pulling the mask aside to eat or talk on the phone um, and then putting the mask back on. That's an example of sort of bad mask wearing. Um, it also has been suggested that mask wearing might make people more careless about, uh, you know, feeling like they have a false sense of security. So not paying as close of attention to things like hand hygiene. But that said, if people want to make their own masks, um, it probably isn't going to hurt that much. Uh, it may be helpful. And in fact, I'm getting emails right now um, where people are debating masks or no masks. Um, but masks alone, I think, in my opinion, are not um, the, the sort of solution for all of this. Mask, need, mask wearing does need to be coupled with um, continued physical distancing and good hand hygiene. Uh, and people should definitely pay attention to the fact when they are wearing a mask, if they choose to make their own or do so, um, pay attention to, to what they're doing in general. Um, just be very conscious of their behavior so that they're not engaging in sort of risky mask practices. Uh, we've got a question here from someone watching from India. India, as you, I'm sure you know, issued a 21-day lockdown with about four hours notice. And the question there is, how, how, do, how do you think that is going to affect the spread there, and, and how would that affect so-called cluster transmission? So um, I think that it, ideally, it should reduce the spread. I don't know how that has been implemented throughout the entirety of the Indian subcontinent. I know that um, you have big cities in India. You also have rural places. And I suspect that that type of lockdown will affect people in both of, in those different environments in different sorts of ways. In general, um, lockdowns uh, seem to be a, sort of effective at, um, and I say sort of effective because even strict lockdowns like in China, if they had worked in, incredibly well, we wouldn't have transmission occurring all around the world right now. Um, so those measures are good at um, slowing and flattening the curve, um, as we is a term that we've all heard. That doesn't mean that it necessarily reduces the total number of people who are going to be infected, absent a vaccine or an effective therapy. That means that it's slowing the rate at which those people are becoming infected to ease the burden on healthcare systems. So in India and everywhere else that um, has lockdowns imposed, really the success of that is going to be measured in how many patients are going into the healthcare systems and how overwhelmed those healthcare systems get. So it really remains to be seen um, in terms of the number of cases. My understanding in India is that widespread testing is not yet available, so we don't have a good understanding of uh, the, the actual number of confirmed cases there. And that's another question we got uh, from, from one of our viewers here is, what, you, what are your recommendations for densely populated countries with not the best hygiene and, and health systems? What, what can people be doing there? Well, I mean, we, we have that in our own country here in the States in New York City, um, which is densely populated and, you know, everybody has their own different hygiene practices. But uh, as somebody who's ridden the subway many times, I can say that there are certainly environments <laughs> in New York City that are not very hygienic. Um, I think that uh, that does play a big role. Um, it really depends, again, on how carefully these um, sort of lockdown and quarantine measures are put in place. Singapore is very densely populated as well, but they've been able to very successfully control the number of new cases by implementing very strict sort of quarantine measures. Um, and actually, they've done it without a ton of widespread population-wide mask wearing. 
Um, so it really, it really depends um, for large cities um, or like Singapore city states. Uh, it really depends on how those measures are implemented um, and how uh, compliant people are with them. A question here from the, which I, I think is from the US, which is when will we be able to go outside? Would that be June? What's your best, do you have a guess or is it a fool's errand to even guess? It's, a, it's not a fool's errand, but it really is speculation right now. We just don't know. Um, a lot of this is going to be dependent on the number of new cases and not just locally, but nationwide. So I'm in Seattle right now where I'm sort of stuck for the duration of this period. Um, yesterday, I was talking to a journalist here at a local radio station about that. And even though in Seattle, the number of deaths are starting to decrease, um, we live in a global, very interconnected world. So even if in one location, it appears that we're kind of getting ahead of this, um, unfortunately, my opinion is that we're all going to have to probably continue sticking this out until that's occurring on a countrywide basis. So I would say at minimum, that's probably going to be, as the, the White House has said here in the U.S., another 30 days um, at least. Uh, Tony Fauci, who's our head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, has said that he's pretty confident in a four to six week to three month time frame. So that's the sort of range that I'm personally operating on right now. A few more questions here from folks. Can you comment on the incubation period and asymptomatic transmission? So the incubation period is thought to be anywhere from two to 14 days, which is quite a large range. Um, that is a very open question because, uh, and this is a technical detail having to do with testing. In the cases that testing occurs in, um, the test measures the genetic material of the virus. It doesn't actually measure the infectious virus itself. So when it comes down to thinking about um, either asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission, um, and I think that pre-symptomatic transmission does occur a lot more frequently than asymptomatic transmission, where the person never gets any symptoms. Um, Pre-symptomatic is when you're transmitting virus prior to uh, becoming symptomatic, um, as well as patients that have recovered and have been reported to shed virus we don't know if they're actually shedding infectious virus. Um, so the amount of time for which somebody remains infectious and is capable of transmitting the virus is a very open question. What we do know about that though, is that it does seem as though people can be infectious um, and transmit prior to developing symptoms. <clears throat> Are we seeing any evidence at all that the virus, <clears throat> excuse me, is mutating at all? So, Coronaviruses are RNA viruses. Um, RNA viruses have a high mutation rate. Uh, they will they develop um, or acquire mutations every time their genomes are copied. So the virus is certainly mutating, but that's not abnormal. That's what RNA viruses do whenever they replicate. We don't have any evidence that suggests that it's accumulating mutations that would make it um, either more pathogenic. Um, or antigenically distinct, which means that it would be able to evade antibodies that uh, have been produced in response to infection. So we don't, yes, the virus is mutating, um, but is it mutating into a more dangerous form? Uh, is it mutating into a variant that could be transmitted in other ways or that would cause a different sort of disease? We have no evidence that that is the case. Great. We have a question here, I would call this an optimistic question. What research is happening that you are most excited about, the most promising for understanding and beating the disease? So certainly um, a lot of new animal models are being developed. And uh, early on in this, people were working with growing virus and cells, which can also be extremely informative about how the virus works, how it infects cells, um, how it grows, what it's capable of growing to. For me, since I study the host response and how that relates to disease, I'm personally excited about these animal models because it allows us to ask questions about pathogenesis, which is the process by which a virus causes disease. Um, having these animal models, uh, there are monkey models being developed, there are ferret models, um, 
these will allow us to ask really, really in-depth questions about how the virus actually makes people really sick or doesn't. Um, and those kind of questions we can't answer with human patients. We have to use these animal models so that we can look at, at all the different organ systems and how the virus is affecting them. So I'm very excited to have those new experimental tools that we can ask these really important questions that have direct application to patient care. And what about testing? Is there any, I, I've been reading and we got a question earlier about testing and the different testing kits that are available or coming available. Are there, are there any changes or anything coming up in that area that you think is encouraging in terms of how fast and how well we can test? So it sounds like there is a rapid test that has been developed and I think it's been FDA approved, but I'm not sure uh, how many, you know, how many uh, how available it is to the general public. I think that that type of testing will be absolutely critical for new cases as they come up since I've just been hearing report after report of how even patients that are sick enough to go seek care, um, not the people who have very mild disease and are staying home, but the people who may go to the hospital, may go to the emergency room, because of a lack of, of swabs and testing supplies that hospital, um, hospital workers have, and also the need for full PPE when taking those types of nasopharyngeal uh, throat swabs um, to do the testing in the hospital, the testing has been very low, at least here in the US. Um, so I think having a rapid at-home test that would be uh, widely available is absolutely critical to understanding the prevalence in the population and taking more targeted steps to, uh, to contain it and break these chains of transmission that are occurring. A question that just came in that I think is pretty relevant to what you're talking about right here is, are we going to be able, as, as a world, be able better to cope with the situation in six months time? Will we have better testing, better, uh, will we have treatment, will we have a vaccine, will we, what, where will we be in six months time? I hope so. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think that, you know, if we do have um, more tests, um, that will be incredibly helpful globally um, in terms of containing spread and dealing with each country's sort of country specific or region specific uh, caseloads. Um, I think that in six months, if we get promising clinical trial data about any of these antiviral therapeutics that are being evaluated, that would be a game changer certainly getting preliminary data about the efficacy of the vaccines that are in the pipeline, any one of them would be incredibly helpful. Um, that will change the outlook on this altogether. Let's talk a little bit about risk factors. There's lots of talk, you know, obviously, and data seems to be indicating so far more men than women are dying of, of COVID-19. Patients with compromised immune systems, pre-existing conditions, whether that's cancer, heart disease, diabetes, or is it also asthma and sinusitis? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, so in general, um, the epidemiological data suggests that people who are older, people with these pre-existing conditions, particularly respiratory conditions, um, such as asthma or COPD, um, heart disease, any kind of cardiovascular disease, um, especially severe diabetes, uh, kidney problems, are all more susceptible to getting severe disease. That doesn't mean that if you have those conditions or if you are an older person that you absolutely will get those. It just means that your risk becomes higher of developing severe disease. Um, in terms of the sex bias that's been observed, that's very interesting to me because it's one thing that I actually study uh, for Ebola. Um, but it does appear that across the world, um, men are more susceptible than women to developing severe COVID-19 and more likely to die from it. Um, initially, we weren't sure if that was a behavioral um, or cultural difference. Uh, for example, in China, um, far more men smoke than women. Um, but in Spain and Italy, where we've also seen these differences uh, that, that those numbers have remained where men are getting sick more often and getting sicker compared to women and men and women smoke at roughly the same rate. Um, so that suggests that it actually is a biological difference rather than uh, a cultural one that can be explained by biases and other, uh, other types of gendered behavior such as smoking. 
Um, the, the thing is though, we really uh, will not know really what all these risk factors are and how much risk they present until we get epidemiological data from around the world. And since right now there are many cases where the people are still actively sick, um, we, it will just take time to compile that all because we don't, we can't associate um, a risk factor with outcome if those patients don't have an outcome yet. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, one person had asked about pre-existing conditions, patients with hypertension on ACE inhibitors or ARBs. I think the question there is not just having the condition, but the, the medication that they're on. Does that, does that increase the risk factor? So um, there was a, an editorial that um, it's key to note that it was a perspective piece. It was not supported by data, um, but a group of researchers hypothesized in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine that taking NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as Advil, um, as well as ACE inhibitors for hypertension, actually increases the amount of a protein called ACE2. ACE2 is the receptor for the virus. So the virus has to attach to a cell that it's infecting to get inside by binding ACE2. Um, they hypothesize that the increases in ACE2 seen uh, in patients who take these drugs means that those patients are more susceptible. And that's, that's just simply not proven. Um, there are a lot of reasons why a virus could be could not uh, grow to higher titers or higher levels of virus just because there's more receptor there. So the receptor is not the only host factor that the virus needs to interact with to replicate. Um, it's also entirely possible that an increase in ACE expression really has no effect ultimately on the amount of virus that a given infected cell can produce. Also, the amount of virus isn't necessarily um, correlated with the severity of disease. So, uh, you know, certainly it's a hypothesis that's worth testing, um, but I have not seen any data personally that suggests that ACE um, inhibitor, taking ACE inhibitors or NSAIDs um, increases your risk significantly of severe COVID. Great, that's very helpful. Speaking of, of medicines, we have a question from a journalist in Nigeria asking if the use of herbs or local medicines as a potential cure is advisable. What would you say to that? My understanding is that the use of traditional medicines in China was done largely um, as, a, as a comforting, um, to comfort patients uh, who had no other options for treatment. Um, as with any type of treatment or therapy, um, folk remedies, traditional medicines, things like that may have value, um, but we won't know that until they are tested rigorously in a controlled clinical trial. So I'd, I'd advise um, anybody who's thinking of using an alternative uh, treatment to just manage their expectations about what that will do and also to very carefully evaluate potential harm that could come from uh, taking, whether, whether it's alternative treatments or unproven medications, um, such as hydroxychloroquine, for example, where we've already had a death here in the United States of somebody essentially self-medicating with chloroquine phosphate. Um, anytime you're taking any type of treatment, whether it be a traditional um, or herbal medication or a more conventional pharmaceutical drug, um, you, really, you really should not be doing that without evidence that it's safe um, and ideally evidence that it's effective. Speaking of which, we have another question here. I'm not sure where, what part of the world this journalist is from, but it asks what you think of the new trend of injecting patients with plasma from people who have recovered from COVID-19. Can you talk so to I, us? Yeah, I wouldn't call that a trend. Um, that, that's, <laughs> it's, it's occurring in clinical trials that are, um, that are well designed. Uh, so plasma transfusion um, or convalescent plasma, it's also called, um, has been around for a really long time. Uh, essentially, it's treating with antibodies. So um, after you've recovered from your initial infection, uh, your body makes antibodies. Plasma is the liquid part of your blood that contains those antibodies. So if you're taking um, plasma from somebody who's recovered from COVID, presumably there are antibodies that can inactivate the virus in that plasma. So if you give that to a patient who is infected with SARS coronavirus 2, um, then those antibodies could potentially inactivate that virus 
and uh, make their disease less severe. We don't know that that actually occurs. In some cases, convalescent plasma therapy has not been particularly helpful or it's only been sort of marginally statistically helpful. Um, we just don't know until that's tried again in a rigorously designed clinical trial, and those trials are beginning now um, in New York and I believe in Baltimore. Great. Can you talk a little bit about pregnancy and COVID-19? That's an issue people obviously, uh, we have a question here about that, and obviously that's a concern for anybody who is pregnant. I don't think that there's a lot known. Um, it, initially, it was thought that, uh, that, that fetuses during development will not be infected with COVID. However, there was a recent preprint out that suggested that um, babies, newborns, um, with mothers who had COVID uh, had antibodies um, and the types of antibodies that don't cross the placenta. So the bottom line is that that's not known, but there's um, some interesting evidence that suggests that uh, vertical transmission or transmission from mother to fetus to newborn um, may be a risk, um, but that, that right now just needs more study. There's also a question here about transmission from pets. Can you transmit it to your pet? Could a pet transmit it if it's on their fur from human to human? What's, what's the, what are the risk factors there? I'd say that transmitting from virus on fur um, is probably possible, but I think that that's probably pretty unlikely also. Um, unless, I mean, you're, unless you're like salivating or, you know, rubbing your hands constantly all over your pet, um, I think that we, we just don't know. Um, but I, I would think that that risk would probably be relatively low. There's only been one anecdotal report, as far as I'm aware, of a pet becoming infected with, uh, with SARS coronavirus 2. That's what we call um, anthropogenic infection, so infection from humans to animals. Um, that was reported to be a, quote, weak case, and I don't know what that means. I'm assuming that means that if they did test the animal, it had low viral loads, um, but I, I'm not entirely sure what that meant, and I haven't seen any actual data on the risk of infecting pets and then the risk of those pets going on to infect somebody else. So overall, I'd say we don't know, but the risk is probably very low. Uh, we've got a question here from a journalist from Tunisia asking about the effect of this on our mental health. I know you're a virologist, not a psychologist, but any, anything you want to say about that? I mean, it, it obviously is having uh, an effect on everybody's mental health. Um, it's incredibly stressful and we're, we're social creatures for the most part. We're not meant to stay isolated in our homes for long periods of time. Um, certainly in some places, including the United States, um, the economic impact that it's having on people is also extremely stressful. Uh, and I'm not, you're correct, I'm not at all a psychologist <laughs> or psychiatrist, um, so I can't comment beyond that, but I, I'm sure you know, you guys should actually maybe consider having somebody like that in one of these uh, webinars because I think that um, that this is uh, going to have long-term impacts on on most people in terms of their mental health. That's a great idea, really good idea. Let me ask you about misinformation. And most journalists, credible journalists are trying desperately, obviously, not to spread misinformation. But are you seeing, are there, are there any issues, one or two issues where you're seeing credible journalism inadvertently spreading falsehoods or things that are, are not quite right? I mean, I, I, I certainly don't want to call anybody out. Um, I've, no names, no names. <laughs> yeah, in my interactions with journalists, um, I can tell when talking to journalists who is um, who is being very conscientious about this and, and who is not. So maybe I, should say, maybe I should just say what I think the conscientious journalists are doing. Um, those are the journalists who will ask me follow-up questions. If there's a part that they don't understand, they will ask me to clarify. And I've even, I've spoken to a couple journalists who normally would not let the people that they interview get, you know, a sneak peek of their piece um, but they've offered that to me and to other scientists just to make sure that they are getting it right and that they are not taking um, 
information out of context or presenting it incorrectly to the public. Those are great practices um, in terms of reporting on science, which, you know, in, in this era of preprints that have not been peer reviewed, um, it's really important to be able to, to understand the sometimes often nuanced um, jargon of these, of these reports. And I really appreciate uh, journalists who take the extra time to make sure that they are interpreting something that I've said or something that they've read correctly prior to, uh, to putting it out there for the public to see. Um, the, the biggest problems I've seen, again, no names, um, are the journalists who uh, probably have been covering something completely different, not related to science or health at all, and have just, as you said, everybody's a COVID journalist now, have been sort of thrown into this. And so they don't necessarily know the right questions to ask. They don't necessarily know who to ask about what. Um, I'm regularly getting questions about patient care, for example, which I'm in no way qualified to answer. I'm not a physician. Um, I've been clear with people that I'm you know, not an epidemiologist. And although I can discuss some of the basics of the epidemiology, I I don't make models for a living. It's hard for me to make projections. Not everybody does that. Um, and so sometimes the journalists who have less experience in this space don't necessarily know how to distinguish people who may not have the expertise uh, that, that would be appropriate for the questions that they're asking. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I'm not sure how to fix that problem. Uh, there are a lot of problematic people on the scientific side too, who are delighted to just be, you know, on the news or in the papers and they will, they will sort of provide incorrect information to journalists. So I, I just would like to say that I do appreciate um, immensely the journalists who, who go the extra mile to get the information right and to make sure that the public is getting good quality, credible information. So it sounds like your advice is make sure your source actually has expertise and what you're asking them asking them about. That's right. And as a general rule of thumb, I would say that um, anybody who claims to be an expert on COVID particularly is not an expert. Um, I would, I'm a virologist and so I have expertise in virology, but this virus, we didn't know about it, you know, four months ago. Um, so I don't know that anybody can be an expert in COVID, much less every single aspect of it from basic virology to patient care. Um, so the, the less somebody knows, um, probably in my view, the more credible they are, uh, especially if they, you know, have fancy affiliations. How, how important, if you could articulate, how important is correct, credible information right now in stopping the spread of this virus? And what role can journalists help play? It's, it's absolutely credible. Uh, critical right now. And some examples of that are um, the, the, the couple in Arizona who took chloroquine phosphate based on President Trump's recommendation that these were miracle drugs and game changers. Um, it's really difficult for journalists to counter what the President of the United States is advising people to do, um, giving medical advice that is not supported by evidence. Unfortunately, because uh, people took that advice, you know, a man is dead and his wife is in intensive care um, because they overdosed on this medication. And that's one fairly extreme example. But I think it's, it's really critical for journalists to call that stuff out when they see it. If, if um, anybody is presenting something as a miracle drug, uh, or the solution to all of our problems, um, journalists really need to question that and they need to call out um, when those types of misinformation are being spread, especially when they have implications for what people might go out and do. Um, the chloroquine situation is also interesting um, in a bad way because physicians uh, have gone out and being that hydroxychloroquine is a drug that's FDA approved in the United States and available to prescribe, they've begun prescribing it to their friends and family members, to themselves in some cases, and hoarding these drugs, which are used for other conditions, and that deprives patients of those drugs. So there can be a lot of really harmful effects if these types of, uh, these types of medical advice um, are dispensed widely without any journalists questioning them or providing a platform for people with expertise to question them, 
uh, to, to get out a, a contradictory message. Great. And the last question we have from folks, uh, people want to know about what are you personally doing? Are you going grocery shopping? Are you wearing a mask? Are you wearing gloves? Do you need to toss those gloves afterwards? So I don't wear gloves um, when I go out and I have tried to minimize um, the amount of time that I spend in places like grocery stores. My husband and I have gone to the grocery store once a week and then we try to go during off hours um, so that they are not as crowded. Uh, about a week ago, we tried to go to Costco and um, the line outside was wrapping around the building and people were definitely not six feet away from each other. So we turned around and left. Um, we are getting we are getting some stuff delivered where possible. Um, certainly there are shortages on like Amazon and other delivery services and it can take a little longer. Um, but we're really trying to minimize the amount of time that we're out um, in public spaces, especially indoor public spaces. We do take walks um, and, and things like that, trying to just keep our distance from our neighbors. Um, but Generally, I'm staying home. Right now, I'm not wearing a mask out, but if the CDC does change its guidance that we should, I will. Um, I do have uh, a couple masks here because um, of my job. I, I actually was supposed to be in India right now, um, and oh, wow. I had, I had uh, taken some N95s um, from work uh, to wear there for pollution um, because I have asthma. Uh, so we do have masks if we need to wear them, but um, I have not until now been wearing masks. I've been relying on physical distancing and good hand hygiene uh, to, to keep me safe. And so far, no symptoms. Which is very good. I, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's useful for people to hear what a virologist, what kind of social distancing and, and hygiene practices you're following. So thank yeah. you very much. And I do follow the guidance of the CDC and the WHO um, I think it is really important, especially now, considering all the misinformation that's out, um, I think it, even though the response may not be perfect um, by either the WHO or the CDC, I think it is really important to listen to our public health authorities and to be uh, an example of, um, of what I think other people should do. So that's kind of how I personally um, am, am approaching this. Well, I think this webinar has been safely social distanced. So um, I want to thank you very much for joining us this morning, uh, morning our time. And thank you everybody who has joined as well. We're really grateful. A reminder that this is on the record. So you can use any quotes freely in your stories, obviously well attributed. And we will make the video, we will archive and upload the video in a couple of hours. So feel, feel free as well to use broadcast and audio clips. I want to also just let you know what else, what we have coming up in the space tomorrow, we will have a Spanish language webinar with Dr. Uh, Gabriela Minaya from Peru, who will answer your questions. And on Friday, we're gonna be looking at how news organizations around the world are managing to cover COVID-19. As, as you all know, this is not an easy story to cover. We'll have Maria Ressa from Rappler in the Philippines, uh, Ritu Kapoor from The Quint in India, and we'll have Branko Burchik from The Daily Maverick in South Africa, and that will be moderated by my colleague, Julie Pacetti, our Director of Global Research, who's based in the UK. Reminder too that you can uh, sign up for this event in our Facebook forum group, and of course, please share information about the forum with your colleagues. So thank you again, Dr. Rasmussen. Thank you, everyone. Everybody stay safe and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.